Listen to part of a conversation between two students in a cafe. Hey, over here. Oh, there you are. So, how are you doing? Not too great. Thanks for agreeing to meet me, though. I really feel like I need to talk to somebody about Professor Barry's class. No problem. You don't mind if I、um, eat my lunch while we chat, do you? My schedule is really tight this semester. I've got to eat whenever I can. This afternoon, I have three classes in a row, and then an evening class, a seminar on jazz history. Of course, go ahead. I know how you feel. I've got six classes this semester. The thing is, I'm doing well in all of them except for literary criticism. I just don't get it. I mean, it's like Professor Barry is speaking a different language sometimes. I know, I know. I'm struggling to understand what he's talking about half the time, too. Yeah, but you got an A on the first test. I got a C. Well, a C isn't that bad. It's just one test. You'll do better next time. You don't understand. I never get C's. I've been a straight A student since. since I got a B plus in biology my freshman year of high school. This class is going to kill my grade point average if I don't do something. You've got to help me. You're not asking me to cheat, are you? Because I. No, no, of course not. I just want. I guess I just want to know what your secret is. You say you're as confused as me, yet you got the best score in the class on the test. How do you do it? What am I doing wrong? Well, I notice you don't ask any questions during class. Whenever something doesn't make any sense to me, I ask Professor Barry to explain it again, and he usually does. Yeah? I don't know. I guess I'm usually too busy scribbling down notes to ask any questions. And, well, to be honest, the real reason is that Professor Barry is pretty intimidating. I'm always scared he's going to yell at me. <laughs> yeah, he is pretty scary. With that long beard and those tiny glasses, he sort of looks like the bad guy in some horror movie. But really, he's not so. He's not so bad once you get to know him. I even stay after class to talk with him once or twice a week. You do? What do you talk about? Well, usually we talk about whatever we discussed in class. Literary criticism is confusing, but it's pretty interesting once you start to figure it out. It's a lot like philosophy in some ways. It is, isn't it? I mean, once you take away all the confusing terminology, they're really just talking about basic stuff. Exactly. Hey, Why don't you stay after class with me on Thursday? We can ask Professor Barry a few questions, talk about some of the things we're struggling with. I think once you get more comfortable with him, you won't be so worried about asking questions during class. And once you start asking more questions, I bet your test scores will improve. You think so? It works for me. You said you wanted to know my secret. I suppose that's it. All right, let's do it. After our next class, we can talk to Professor Barry together. I'll try to think up some insightful questions to ask him. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. 1. Why does the man meet with the woman? 2. What class are the students discussing? 3. Why does the man avoid asking questions in class? 4. Four. Why does the woman suggest they both stay after class on Thursday? Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. And once you start asking more questions, I bet your test scores will improve. You think so? It works for me. You said you wanted to know my secret. I suppose that's it. 5. Why does the woman say this?
I suppose that's it. Listen to part of a lecture in a botany class. Tropisms. What are they and what causes them? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. A tropism, you see, is the growth movement of a plant in response to, er, uh, to a certain type of stimulus. Perhaps the clearest example of tropism that I can give you is something that is called phototrophism. In phototrophism, the uh, stimulus in question is sunlight. I think this is a phenomenon that we've all observed at one point or another in our daily lives. The stem of a growing plant will bend in the direction of the sun. Its leaves will also turn toward the, toward the sunlight. This is a type of tropism. Another type of tropism involves water, rather than sunlight, as a stimulus. It's not as easy to observe, but the roots of a plant will grow toward a source of water, just as its stem will grow toward the sun. This is called hydrotrophism. But today I want to talk about a third type of tropism, gravitropism. Ask yourself this. When you plant a seed, when you dig a hole and put it in the ground, is it necessary to position the seed in a certain way to, um, to assure that the roots grow in a downward direction and the stem grows up? Of course not. But there's no sunlight in the dirt and often there isn't a source of water nearby. Gravitrophism, however, is a trophism in which the stimulus required is something that is absolutely everywhere, at least everywhere on Earth. I'm talking, of course, about gravity. The force of gravity is a stimulus involved in gravitrophism. There are um, basically two kinds of gravitrophism. There's positive gravitrophism, and there's negative gravitrophism. A plant grows toward the source of sunlight and away from the source of gravity. But its roots grow toward the source of gravity. The, um, the roots are then an example of positive gravitrophism, and the stem, the stem is an example of negative gravitrophism. Now, in any kind of trophism, there are three steps that must take place. The first is the, er, uh, the perception of the stimulus. The second step is the transmission of this information to the appropriate part of the plant. And the third step is the reaction of that specialized part of the plant. In the case of gravitrophism, it isn't yet completely clear what is involved in the first and second steps. There is a theory that plants perceive gravity through the movement of starch grains contained in special cells, but it hasn't been proven and the manner in which this information is relayed is even more of a mystery. As for the third step, it involves a type of, um, hormone, something called auxins. These hormones are produced in the growing tips of the plant, but are redistributed down to the plant's root caps. Root caps are the part of the plant that receives the information in gravitrophism, a kind of cone-shaped tissue found at the tip of each root. The hormones cause the roots to grow downward. If you were to remove the root caps from a plant, gravitrophism would no longer occur. Here's an experiment you can try at home if you like to demonstrate gravitrophism to your family and friends. Take a potted plant and turn it on its side. After a day or two, you'll see that the stem has turned upward, away from gravity and possibly toward the sun. And if you were to... Uh, dig in the soil of the pot, you'd find that the roots had turned in a downward direction, toward gravity. Now, this simple experiment may not be very good for the health of your houseplants, but it does provide a practical example of gravitrophism at work. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. 6. What is the talk mainly about? Seven. Which of the following does the professor cite as stimuli in various tropisms? Click on three answers.
8. According to the professor, what is the first step in gravitropism? Nine. What does the professor say about root caps? Ten. Why does the professor suggest that students set a house plant on its side? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. But today I want to talk about a third type of tropism, gravitropism. Ask yourself this, when you plant a seed, when you dig a hole and put it in the ground, is it necessary to position the seed in a certain way to, um, to assure that the roots grow in a downward direction and the stem grows up? Of course not. 11. Why does the professor say this? Is it necessary to position the seed in a certain way to, um, to assure that the roots grow in a downward direction and the stem grows up? 12. Listen to part of a talk in a biology class. The Amazon rainforest is abundant with different types of species. No other region in the world has so much diversity in both flora and fauna. In one hectare of rainforest, you might find 750 different types of trees. That's just in one hectare. I could go on and on about the biodiversity of plants and animals found in the Amazon rainforest, but I'm sure it isn't news to you. Anyway, how do you think it came to be that way? That diverse, I mean. It was because of an ice age. How would an ice age create such an abundance of life? Well, what happened was, during the most recent ice ages, parts of the rainforest, um, they basically got isolated from each other. So, for example, say we have a species of butterfly with a habitat spanning a certain region. Then along comes an ice age and glaciers intrude into this region and split it in two. The butterflies in each region evolve differently over time, until they finally become different species. So it was climatic events in the Amazon during the recent ice ages that caused so many new species to emerge? Yeah. That's what we call the refuge theory. And it is, indeed, just a theory. I thought it was a pretty well-accepted theory, though. It was until recently. I'll get into that, but first let me explain to the rest of the class what the refuge theory is. OK, so in South America, we had extensive tropical forests. Then a period of ice ages came along. So, according to the theory, glaciers advanced into the forests, breaking them up into sections. Um, see, because the ice didn't completely cover the region. It sort of sectioned it off into distinct refuges. So what happened was, species got, um, they got separated geographically isolated. Since the separated populations were no longer sharing a gene pool, um, any genetic mutations that occurred in one of the isolated populations, um, any genetic mutations in one population brought that, uh, that population in a different evolutionary direction, not necessarily in the same direction as the other half of its species. Eventually, the two populations would evolve into different species. OK, so that's the refuge theory. But now evidence that, um, that refutes that theory is starting to accumulate. Yeah, you started to mention that earlier. What kind of evidence are you talking about? Well, you said yourself that it was ice ages that caused refuges to develop in South American rainforests, right? So, what time period are we talking about with advancing and receding glaciers? Um, well, I was thinking of the Pleistocene epoch. Um, it's the Pleistocene epoch, right? Right. And about how long ago was that? Hmm, that was around, um, close to two million years ago. 
maybe 1.6 to 2 million years ago. Exactly. Now listen to this. New fossil evidence from the Patagonian desert indicates that South America probably had a ton of plant diversity way, way long before the Pleistocene ice ages. I mean around 50 million years ago. 50 million years ago? Wow, that estimate is really different from the estimate given by the refuge theory. You're right. It really calls the refuge theory into question, huh? And there's more evidence, too. See, another researcher was studying pollen from dried-up lakes and discovered that the Amazon was covered with trees during the entire Pleistocene epoch. There never were any glaciers. So, that pretty much disproves the refuge theory. OK, a y but that doesn't answer the original question. So the refuge theory is out. But what caused the biodiversity? I don't know. You don't know? No, just because you rule out one theory doesn't mean you necessarily come up with another. But it's the first step, isn't it? Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. 12. What is the talk mainly about? Thirteen. Why does the professor mention the number of tree species in a hectare of rainforest? Fourteen. According to the refuge theory, how did advancing glaciers affect the gene pool of a species? Fifteen. According to the refuge theory, during what time period did many species diversify? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. So it was climatic events in the Amazon during the recent ice ages that caused so many new species to emerge? Yeah. That's what we call the refuge theory. And it is, indeed, just a theory. I thought it was a pretty well-accepted theory, though. 16. Why does the professor say this? And it is, indeed, just a theory. 16. Listen again to part of the lecture. Then answer the question. Exactly. Now listen to this. New fossil evidence from the Patagonian desert indicates that South America probably had a ton of plant diversity way, way long before the Pleistocene ice ages. I mean around 50 million years ago. 50 million years ago? Wow, that estimate is really different from the estimate given by the refuge theory. 17. What can be inferred about the student? 18. Listen to part of a conversation between a student and an advisor. Hi, uh, is this the financial aid department? Yes, it is. What is it you have a question about? Well, um, I got this account statement last week, and it says I owe $400. Wait, which company is your student loan with? It's with... NHLS, MSK Education? Yeah, yeah, that's it. MSK Education. Okay, fine. What were you saying? Uh, that I'm overdue $400, but I sent in a check more than three weeks ago. My payment was actually ahead of schedule, so I'm not sure about this statement. Well, MSK has an online account management website. You can access your balance, make payments, um, track your recent payments. If you go online, I'll give you the website address in a minute. You can check your account there. 
See, because it's electronic, it's much more up to date than whatever paper statements you receive. In fact, I recommend you rely on the website more than on mailings you receive from them. Uh, okay. But what about this paper statement I already have? Chances are your paper statement doesn't reflect the most recent changes in your account. They probably received your payment, but it just hadn't been recorded yet when they sent you the bill. There's quite a delay. Annoying, I know. Well, okay, I'll check out that website. Great. Well, I'll give you my card so you can call me in case you still have trouble. Um, also, I'm worried that I'll be charged a late fee, though. I mean, according to the statement I got in the mail, my check was late, so even if they did get it eventually, I'll probably have to pay that fee. Well, normally they figure it's your responsibility to mail it in early enough. But you said you mailed the check three weeks ago. Well, that sounds like it's not your fault. Yeah, I mean, in the past I've mailed checks only two weeks before the due date and had no problems. I don't know what happened. Usually they're understanding about stuff like that. You should call MSK and explain your situation. They'll probably remove the late fee. The contact number should be on your statement. Oh, in here, let me give you that website. Thanks. So the website, it's pretty easy to use? Yeah, it's self explanatory. Also, you can make payments online, and the money gets taken out of your account the next business day. Well, that sounds a lot easier. Thanks. I'll check it out. Great. Okay, here's my card in case you still have any problems after looking at the website. Just give me a call. I'm usually here until 7 on weeknights. Okay, thanks. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. 18. Why does the student go to see the financial aid advisor? 19. According to the advisor, what is MSK Education's policy about late payments? 20. Why does the student mention the late fee? 19. Listen again to part of the conversation. Then answer the question. Well, normally they figure it's your responsibility to mail it in early enough. But you said you mailed the check three weeks ago. 21. What does the advisor mean when she says this? But you said you mailed the check three weeks ago. 21. Listen again to part of the conversation. Then answer the question. Well, that sounds a lot easier. Thanks. I'll check it out. Great. Okay, here's my card in case you still have any problems after looking at the website. Just give me a call. I'm usually here until 7 on weeknights. Okay, thanks. 22. What can be inferred about the advisor? 22. Listen to part of a lecture in an architecture class. So last time I introduced the topic of ancient Greek architecture. And, as you know, it's a somewhat distinctive aspect of the Greek civilization. Now today I want to narrow down the topic to one very specific aspect of Greek architecture, columns. Uh, in Greek architecture, columns, you know, had a structural purpose, of course, and were important in supporting the roofs of buildings but they were also used as a form of decoration. I think this is uh, really obvious when you start looking at the columns themselves. They come in different, different styles, which all have their own characteristic designs. Okay, before I get into the details of those styles, well, let me start with uh, an introduction of the components of a typical column. Basically, a column has three parts. There's the base, 
the shaft, and the capital. Now, you can probably tell from the name, but the base, the base is the very bottom segment of the column. Uh, it's a separate piece that kind of, uh, well, it looks like it attaches the main part of the column to whatever flat surface the column sits on. Does that make sense? It's actually sort of an optional feature. Not all columns have them. On top of that, of course, is the shaft, the main vertical cylinder. And at the top of the shaft is the capital, the decorative element that, um, well, it does support some weight, but mostly functions as just a decoration. The capital is the most important part of the column because it's the feature that varies most between styles. Essentially, when you're determining what style a particular column belongs to, you'll focus on the capital for the, for the biggest clues. So, in ancient Greek architecture, there are three different classifications for column. Uh, styles. But there's a special term that's used instead of styles, and that's orders. So, there are three different orders of columns. The Doric order, the Ionic order, and the, the Corinthian order. So, let's see. The Doric order is the oldest style. It came into popularity around the 7th century BC. In appearance, it's somewhat simple, um, especially when compared to the two orders that came after it. There's no base, and the capital is rather uh, plain, with very few details. The column shaft does have some slight decoration in the form of vertical grooves, though this is also common in both of the other orders. Proportionately, Doric columns are the um, thickest. That is, their height is only four to six times their diameter, so they seem sturdier, uh, bulkier in appearance than Ionic or Corinthian columns. Doric columns are actually the most common style to appear in Greek architecture. Next came the Ionic order, which was also quite popular in ancient Greek architecture. It was uh, fairly widespread throughout Greece by the 5th century BC. Ionic columns are set on a, um, a base, so the shaft does not rest directly on the, the foundational surface. Now, as I mentioned before, the most important differences between the orders can be found in the column's capitals. On top of the shaft, Ionic columns have a, a scroll-like capital. Can you picture it? The sides of the capital look like the, um, like the curled up edges of a paper scroll. So the capitals of Ionic and Doric columns are really, they're, uh, really different, but there's another pretty significant difference between these two orders. And that's their proportions. Where the Doric order has stocky columns, the, um, the Ionic order has slimmer, more delicate shafts. The height-to-diameter ratio for ionic columns is 8 to 1. Actually, the third style, the Corinthian order, is relatively similar to the ionic order, especially in terms of um, proportions. Both ionic and Corinthian columns are slimmer than Doric columns. The Corinthian order features a base, a thin grooved shaft, and a decorated capital. Of the three styles, Corinthian is the most ornate. Shapes of vines and leaves have been, have been carved into the capital, and it actually incorporates a smaller version of the scroll-like decorations that appear on the capitals of Ionic columns. The Corinthian order was the latest of the styles appearing around the 4th century BC. This order, though, was not very popular in Greek architecture and didn't get used very much. However, all three orders have seen quite a bit of use since the end of the ancient Greek civilization. Some people still find Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian columns to be elegant and stately. So examples of these Greek orders are not limited to ancient ruins. Modern-day versions can be seen in universities, public libraries, and capital buildings. These Greek architectural styles still enjoy quite a bit of popularity. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer.
23. What does the professor mainly discuss? Twenty four. According to the professor, which part of the column differs most between orders? Twenty five. How does the professor compare the proportions of Doric and Ionic columns? Twenty six. What does the professor say about Corinthian columns? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Now, you can probably tell from the name, but the base, the base is the very bottom segment of the column. Uh, it's a separate piece that kind of, uh, well, it looks like it attaches the main part of the column to whatever flat surface the column sits on. Does that make sense? 27. What does the professor mean when she says this? Does that make sense? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. On top of the shaft, ionic columns have a, a scroll-like capital. Can you picture it? 28. Why does the professor say this? Can you picture it? Listen to part of a discussion in a history class. Okay, today's topic is the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, an act that's notable in that it was the first antitrust legislation to be passed by the U.S. Congress. Now, let's get started by taking a look at the word antitrust. What exactly does it mean? Well, it refers to business trusts and, um... Basically, any type of monopoly that... I hate to interrupt, but before you go any further with your explanation of antitrust, maybe you should first give us a quick definition of what a monopoly is. Oh, okay. Um, well, a monopoly is a situation when there's only a single provider of a certain product or service, and consumers aren't given any options. Excellent definition. Please continue. Sure. So, um, I was saying... Antitrust laws are simply laws that are designed to prevent businesses from forming trusts or any other types of monopolies. That's it, I guess. Okay, so, because big businesses sometimes try to control a particular industry by manipulating prices, production, or distribution, um, what does that do? It eliminates the type of, um, fair competition that benefits the, the consumer. Um, so the federal government felt the need to create antitrust legislation, namely the Sherman Act. It was signed by President Harrison and named for Senator John Sherman of Ohio, the, uh, the commerce regulation specialist who wrote it. At the time it was passed, um, several individual states had already passed their own, uh, their own antitrust legislation, but these laws were limited to, uh, intrastate businesses. I mean, um, businesses that, uh, that operated solely within the boundaries of that particular state. But since Congress has the constitutional power to regulate interstate commerce, the Sherman Act was a far more effective solution. Now, there were two main provisions of the Sherman Act. The first made it illegal to restrain interstate or foreign trade, um, including price-fixing, um, limiting production, sharing markets, and um, excluding competition. The second provision made it illegal to create uh, a monopoly on any aspect of trade or commerce. Excuse me, Professor? I was wondering, what happened to the people who got caught? You know, CEOs of big companies that ignore the Sherman Act? Well, 
The maximum penalty for individuals found guilty of violating the Sherman Act was, um, I believe it was a $5,000 fine and one year in prison. More importantly, however, the offending organization would be dissolved, meaning it would be broken up into smaller units with far less power. Cool. Yes, cool. Now, even though the Sherman Act gave Congress the power to, um, dissolve trusts and monopolies, well, in practice, the Supreme Court blocked this usage of the act for years. It wasn't until President Roosevelt's hard-nosed, trust-busting campaign that the act was actually used with some success. Ah, uh, he managed to break up the Northern Securities Company. Later, President Taft used it to break up both the American Tobacco Company and the Standard Oil Trust. In 1914, President Wilson's administration supplemented the Sherman Act with an additional act and a commission. The first, the, uh, the Clayton Antitrust Act, added the word monopoly to the act's language for the first time. It also put a stop to the blatant misuse of the act as a tool to break up unions, which, of course, went against the original intent of the Sherman Act. The second supplement, which is a commission known as the Federal Trade Commission, um, it's a federal body with the power to investigate suspected violations of antitrust laws. Excuse me, Professor? Is it okay if I ask another question? Of course it is. Thanks. Um, what about nowadays? Is the Sherman Act still being used, or has it sort of been, you know, swept under the rug? Well, back in 1974, a suit was filed under the Sherman Act against the American Telephone and Telegraph Corporation, more commonly known as AT&T. Six years later, their monopoly was broken up, and more recently... In the 1990s, the Federal Trade Commission used the Sherman Act to go after the Microsoft Corporation. In 2000, it was ruled that Microsoft had to break up into two companies. However, that decision was overturned in an appeals court in 2001. To this day, despite the Sherman Act, Microsoft remains whole and undissolved. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. 29. What is the discussion mainly about? Thirty. According to the professor, what was deemed illegal under the Sherman Act? Click on two answers. Thirty-one. What type of action did the Clayton Antitrust Act put a stop to? Thirty-two. Why does the professor mention AT&T? Thirty-three. What does the professor mean when he says this? Now, let's get started by taking a look at the word antitrust. What exactly does it mean? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Well, it refers to business trusts and, um... Basically, any type of monopoly that... I hate to interrupt, but before you go any further with your explanation of antitrust, maybe you should first give us a quick definition of what a monopoly is. 34. Why does the professor say this? I hate to interrupt, 